Okay, um, got just a few things I want to hit on here before we we get uh, going to, uh, into questions. Good, good to be with you all. Uh, uh, thank you for for coming over here today. <clears throat> um, so the first thing I just wanted to mention um, is a little bit sad. Um, we, you know, when you are. Um, Many of us are parents in here, and we have uh, many of you guys have probably moved for a job. And you know, when you move for a job and you have kids, uh, one of the first things you think about is, okay, how am I going? How's my my kids? How are my um, <clears throat> son or daughter? How are they going to adjust to a new place? And in particular, you know, how are they going to adjust to a new school? And um, my seven-year-old, uh, she can get a little bit nervous at times, and um, two years ago when we moved here, she, she loved the school that she was, she was a part of at Butler um, in Indianapolis, and, and two years ago when she moved here, she was obviously really nervous, and um, the school that she was a part of, the principal there, uh, was just unbelievable his his name is Chris Kolaris and uh, Chris passed away on Saturday um, <clears throat> so I didn't you know <clears throat> So, so obviously, you know, <clears throat> I didn't know Chris well, um, but Sorry. But I think anybody who um, takes care of your kids me means a lot to you. So he was tremendous uh, in the Wycliffe community. And uh, our deepest condolences uh, to his family. All right, sorry for that, <clears throat> um, but I did I did want to mention uh, Chris. His his last name is C O L L A R O S. Okay, <clears throat> moving forward. Super happy for Mike Shragi and <clears throat> um, his family. Um, Mike was uh, a tremendous asset for us for a number of years, um, dating back to Butler. And um, I tell you, he was, he, he, he was ready for this opportunity. <clears throat> Mike's a guy that, you know, a couple years ago when, when uh, we were, were looking to hire him, he was, he was really considering um, whether or not he was, he was going to continue to coach. So really happy for Mike on his move to Elon. I think Elon hired a fantastic coach. Um, Amanda, uh, Andrew, Sophie, they're, they're going to they're gonna really enjoy the Shragi family. It's always a little bit bittersweet when you lose a staff member. Um, and and uh, we're just, we're super happy for them. Um, so I, I mentioned to you guys after the season that I thought potentially we could lose uh, one or, or two guys. And um, that almost happened. So... Uh, uh, I'll leave it at that for, for now, but super happy for Mike. Um, I also want to mention uh, Caleb Wesson uh, has added his name for consideration for the 2019 NBA draft. Um, he, he's going to go through the process, 
and um, while also re retaining his eligibility. Um, I want to make that clear uh, that, that he is going to go through this process and, and maintain his, his, elig his NCAA eligibility. Um, but uh, I fully support him in, in going through this process. Um, and, um, you know, we're, um, we're, we're, we're going to walk it through it with him. So uh, that, that process be has, has begun about uh, a week ago. Um, and we'll, we'll see where it leads. We've, we've begun to gather some information from um, uh, the uh, advisory committee um, for, for guys that are going through this process. And that's been helpful. And it'll continue to be as we go through it. But um, I know Caleb is, is anxious to get feedback. Um, I la lastly, I just want to um, I just want to thank our, our fans for uh, their support this year. It was certainly a year full of uh, uh, certainly some ups and certainly some downs, but uh, we're, we're super uh, grateful for the support of our fans and uh, uh, feel uh, really excited about uh, the health of our program. Um, and yet also realize that we have to make uh, significant growth and improvement in, in so many ways, and that'll be our charge here uh, in the off season. So um, with that, I will uh, leave it up to questions. I don't even know if I mentioned Chris was the principal at my daughter's uh, elementary school. Um, so uh, with that, I'll open it up to questions. Chris, with uh, Mike leaving and um Jaden transferring, you've obviously got some holes to fill on the roster and on the coaching staff. I just wonder where you are in the process of, of filling everything out and hopefully finalizing a, a roster as much as you can at this time of year for next year. Yeah, um, we're getting there. I think it's, a, it's you know, uh, to be honest with you, we, we have had, uh, in today's day and age of college basketball, we've had very little, uh, up, apart from the first couple months on the job, uh, we've had very little um, uh, turnover in our program uh, from players. To, it's been, you know, when you, when you take over a program, you, you expect there to be really in the first two to three years significant uh, turnover. Not as much staff, but certainly player uh, turnover. We, we have not had that. Um, and in today's day and age, it's just an expectation every year. So really, Adam, to some degree, you're always planning for that. Um, uh, from, from, it's not like it's a, it's a sudden thing. You're, you're always planning for that. Uh, we're always, um, um, you know, recruiting and, and actively recruiting, whether it's high school kids or transfers, uh, knowing that there's, there's going to be uh, inevitable uh, turnover in today's game. And... Um, you know, I think that uh, um, as far as staff, I've, I've now been in a position where uh, these last couple years I've expected that as well. Um, and so you're, you're mindful of that in terms of building relationships with guys that you feel like could be potential replacements. But having said that, um, I'm not close to making a decision uh, on that and um, – who we're gonna who we're gonna add in terms of our roster? Uh, that's still fairly fluid right now. Do you have a, a time frame in mind as far as I mean? Obviously, recruiting ramps up here really soon. I guess how you cover that while you're down a st uh, co member and, and how you, or I guess when you'd like to have somebody in. Um, yeah, I think we certainly would like to have somebody in by the first AAU weekend, which is at the end of this month. Um, uh, so, you know, there's some human resource stuff that has to happen in terms of advertising the position and some of those kind of things. But certainly we would like to have it in, uh, I'd like to have someone added by that weekend. Um, in, the, in the meantime, um, you know, Mike Nettie is assuming a lot of uh, Mike Schrage's duties um, uh, on a temporary basis. Chris, um, you have two spots available now, I guess, with, with Jay's uh, transfer. Um, could you just sort of walk through, in terms of additions to the roster, what you're looking for? It seems like backup center might be at the top of the list. Is there anything else 
that's on that list that you could be looking for to, to add the roster? Yeah, so that, that's probably um, – that's, that's, it, it probably begins there. We're, we're looking for a, um, an interior backup um, guy for, for Caleb. Um, we also could potentially look at another position if we felt like um, whether that's a, a versatile, another versatile wing forward. I, I don't know, but 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 certainly, uh, the difficult thing in some ways as a coach is, you know, I know coaches where they their philosophy is, hey, we're we're only going to have nine or ten eligible players. Um, that's it. We're not adding more than nine or ten eligible players that think they're going to. Now, you might add a guy who's going to sit out or whatever, but nine or ten that think they're going to play. Because what happens when you get into, um, you know, the guts of the Big Ten season? You're talking about, right, eight to nine, in some cases, ten-man rotation, but usually eight to nine a lot of, in a lot of cases. So why would you have 13 guys on your roster that all expect to play and think to play? It's foolish. It creates a team dynamic that's not always healthy. Um, but – this case with us, we, you know, we do have, um, you know, we're going to have a significant amount of youth on this team that we're trying to figure, we're still trying to figure our roster out in some ways. Um, so that may mean that we may have, you know, we may add another guy as, as potentially a backup five. But do I think we would add two more? No, not right now. Not two more eligible guys. Okay, I guess I, that was going to be my follow-up question. You don't anticipate being aggressive with both of those open spots for guys who could play next year. But you've, you've talked about, too, the value of having sit one year transfers, yes. too. Do you think that could be a target for that extra spot? Absolutely. It, it, it'll be a target every year. Uh, every, I, I don't think I'll ever, with, with 13 available scholarships and always knowing that you can't keep your entire roster uh, I mean, it, there's going to be some degree of turnover most years. I think uh, we'll always look at, uh, you know, an older guy that can uh, be a part of our practices, that can understand uh, how we do things and then assume a, a role the next season. So I think it will always be an avenue we'll look at. We'll, we'll see. We're certainly uh, having conversations with some guys right now, um, but we'll see where that goes. With, <clears throat> with Caleb, uh, a lot of guys you see, test these waters the first time and, and, yeah. and come back. Conversations with him, how real do you think it is he departs the program and then advantages for you guys if he does choose to come back, what this can, can lead maybe going into next year? Well, I think the feedback's always good. Um, I think Caleb um, is, is bright and his family, um, uh, I think, has a, a – good and, and reasonable understanding of what this process is and kind of where uh, he currently is. Um, so I think all that's, that's really helpful. Um, you know, I, I don't know what I would put, put odds are, but odds on, but I, I think he's, you know, we're every day kind of getting feedback that gives us and gives him a better idea of kind of where he currently stands and, and right. Uh, NBA organizations have to determine from here, like, do they want to have him a part of their workouts and, and those kind of things. She, you know, Caleb really made significant strides from one year to the next. Um, I think he had a real significant uh, improvement and growth. And, and uh, I think for him, um, he understands that that's got to continue to happen. Um, but uh, like I said, I support him going through this process and the feedback that he's going to get. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of see together what it looks like for him. And to follow up, you said together, how involved do you guys stay with him as he goes through the process? How, how much do you communicate? How how's that all work? Yeah, we're, we'll talk on a daily basis. Um, but, you know, talk on a – obviously now I'm traveling a lot. Um, but uh, we've, we, I've got a staff member that's in charge of, of kind of touching base with him uh, each and every day. The, the interesting dynamic right now with, with, with what's going on in the NBA is that is, or with this rule change is that you can hire an agent now. And then you have to fire the agent, basically, um, in, in, a t in a certain – so there are very specific timelines that have to happen. Um, 
and uh, we put our compliance as well as a staff member in charge of making sure that he is on top of all that because it's a lot. It's a lot for him and it's a lot for his family. So um, we've, we're working really closely with him on all that. So whether he des decides to hire an agent, that'll kind of be up to him and his family to decide. You guys uh, last year did pretty well with the three-man class that you have coming in as of right now. But it seems like a year ago at this time, well, Gaffney may have been committed already. I don't know. But the other two guys were probably among a list of about 20 to 25 guys that you were going out yeah. in April yes. to evaluate. And then they, they kind of bubbled to the top for you. As you kind of start back in on that process, uh, how do you see this working out? And, and do you feel like you guys are positioned to get the right two or three guys that you need in 2020 and, and just work in the process that, that yeah. seemed to work pretty well last year? Yeah, I think one of you guys asked me that in this post uh, – press conference last year. How do you feel about recruiting? Do you feel like you're behind? It might have been you. Was it you that asked that? It could have been. Either <laughs> me or Adam, probably. I don't know. Um, I, you know, at that point, I felt like we were positioned pretty well with some guys. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, the next, like, two, three months, four months, really, really critical, really important. Um, you know, I, I feel like we're in the same position. I, I think it's always a challenge when you recruit when you have a, a good recruiting class, in some cases a really good recruiting class, to back that up with another really good recruiting class. But that's what we need to do. Like, that is absolutely what we need to do as we uh, continue to build our roster. That has to happen. Now, what's that going to look like? Is that going to look like two guys or three guys? Um, more than that, I, I'm not sure at this point. Um, but uh, I, I think we're positioned uh, well. But listen, these, these next three or four months are critical for that in some cases shorter time frame I mean, it's critical it's a lot of work um, it's going to be a lot of travel and and a lot of time on the phone and continuing to build relationships and you know when you it's it's why it's imperative right now that uh, we in short order hire an assistant who can follow up on on some of the things that that uh, we lost with Mike and just as an aside uh, the calendar changing this year I think maybe you had two weekends in the spring and three in the summer last year, and now it's, what, down to one and two, and then yeah. the state association event. Or I assume you're yeah. able to, which I know they're having that late June, I guess. Just are you in favor of these changes, or what? Uh, what's your thought? It seems like it's going to be a lot easier to make mistakes if you can't see them as much as you could possibly see them in the past. You know, to, to be honest with you, Steve, I, I, I need to probably go through it to get a feel for um, how I feel about it one way or the other um, because um, I just don't know. I, I know it's, it, it feels like we're going to be out traveling more and in some cases significantly more. Um, but uh, I don't know. I just need, I need, I need to go through it and see. It's, it's going to be different, and um, I think there are probably going to be some things we're going to really like about it and some things we're not going to. I know you referenced wanting to hire an assistant soon. Is there a timeline that you have on that? And, and are you looking within the program at all? Yeah, I mean, we're, you're always, um, you know, we have a tremendous, uh, tremendous staff that I feel really good about. Um, you know, you have Mike Netty, who, who has been an assistant uh, at, at a high level, has experience, um, uh, was at East Carolina. Obviously, I worked together, so I, I saw him. Uh, kind of go through and recruit guys, um, and he brings a level of experience just being an on-the-floor assistant and on-the-road recruiter. Uh, and, and obviously, Scooney Penn, who has uh, been a tremendous asset for us. Uh, I think we all love Scooney, um, and uh, we've, we've loved having him around uh, and a part of our program. Uh, so those two guys are always guys that you're uh, looking at and evaluating. Uh, I, I think, you know, I'm looking for someone who um, can bring a level of, of uh, uh, experience in recruiting uh, a, as well as um, uh, on-the-floor coaching um, and who's, who's shown the ability to do that uh, effectively. Um, so there's, there's, there's a small pool of guys that I'm considering right now. Um, and those two guys within the staff are, are part of that. 
In terms of the player that um, you might add as Caleb Watson's backup or whatnot, um, do you anticipate possibly adding another freshman to the class? Is, is that still a possibility? It is. Yeah, it's a possibility. Um, you know, I, I don't think, I don't, I don't know that I would necessarily, I think four freshmen are, are plenty. Um, uh, so we, we could potentially add another one. Um, you know, I think ho hopefully we will reap the benefits of, of playing our, a lot of our young guys this year. And uh, as I told them, listen, that's, uh, there were some things we went through this year that I hope we, we never go through again. Um, you know, 8 and 12 in the Big Ten is not good enough. It's not good enough. And um, uh, we, have to, we have to be better uh, in, in certain areas. Um, and uh, we have to find the way. I, I'm, I'm so proud of our guys. Uh, the way that, that we were able to respond to some, some tough stuff and finish the season. Uh, but what you really hope is um, uh, the, the youth that we played this year uh, and the youth that we'll play this coming season will, pro will provide benefits for us here moving forward. And speaking of the, the coming youth, um, I don't know if you've run through those three guys, but if you could just like – Define like why did you why are these the three guys who who you guys chose to add and, and what really stood out to them in the recruiting process? Uh, you know, Gaffney I think was the first to commit. Um, he's got great potential and and I think that's what he's heard probably about him since he's for the last three or four years. Um, he's he's going to have to find the level of consistency um, in performance and consistency of effort that that I think is 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 he's so gifted. Um, it's just as as we've seen in his high school career right now, he's 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 got to find the level of consistency uh, of performance uh, with him. But he's he's got um, tremendous um, uh, potential, which is always a, a fun word, but a scary word for for coaches. Um, I think EJ uh, or D will go DJ. I think DJ was the second one to commit. Uh, DJ's uh, competitive, hard nosed, um, athletic. Um, uh, point guard that, that uh, is someone that we identified really early on as a major, major priority for us. And then EJ, we just, we loved, you know, we liked all EJ and Alonzo's versatility. Uh, we thought we needed some versatile, um, a forward, versatile, uh, some, some uh, guys that could play multiple positions. Um, EJ's a kid who's won two state championships. He values winning. Um, he's got a, he's a guy that has just all three of them have really natural uh, ability. And uh, at the same time, I, I recognize that all three of them are going to have uh, their, their share of struggles. There's no question about it. Um, but I'm a, I'm a major, like none of them were, all, were McDonald's All-Americans, uh, but uh, they certainly would have gotten my vote, that's for sure. When you look at your 2020 class, you don't have any commits yet in that class. And when you... There's only one guy on this team who's guaranteed to not be here after next season. Um, how much when you approach that class is it, you know, just trying to get the best players you can get versus maybe just getting a guy who can plug a role? Yeah, I think it's going to be a combination of both. Um, but I definitely think I, we are looking at, okay, hey, where does our roster maybe, where do we uh, feel like we need help in our roster? Um, and some of that is, right, it's hard. You know, we've got young guys that are still growing, so it's hard to know exactly. I, I think it's clear that, that on the interior, um, uh, 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 an interior guy is going to be important, a five-man is going to be important. But after that, we'll look, and uh, we're always going to look at what we need. Um, and yet at the same time, um, we're also going to look to how, how do we continue to elevate our roster. Chris, from a health standpoint, with Kyle getting a chance to for some time off, I guess how is he doing? And any sort of cleanup stuff for guys going into the off season? Um, yeah. So health-wise, I think uh, the typical stuff. Guys who've gotten back, <clears throat> you, typically we'll give the guys about two weeks off after the season. But um, the calendar, the way the calendar worked this year, we basically had about a week and a half with them before we weren't going to see them for another month. So we'd started a little bit earlier uh, with, with Q. Um, 
and uh, everybody's fine. The, the only guy that's not doing workouts right now or anything is Kyle, and he's been mandated to to stay off his leg for for the time being. And just it's just sort of from a broad picture, you've talked about eight and twelve in the Big Ten is not good enough, and you know, resetting expectations going forward a little bit. You guys are starting to be widely picked in way too early lists of top 25 for next year. And it seems like with the guys you have coming in, there are some pretty good expectations for next year. And I just wonder how you feel about all that as you go into an off season, knowing that um, if you want to say you've been under the radar here for the last two years, that doesn't seem like it will be the case next year. Do you have a feel for that at all or how you, I guess, what the off season might be like for you against that backdrop? Uh, you know, I didn't get into – coaching at the highest level of college basketball to be fearful of expectations. Um, I also realize, as, as so many of, of you guys do, that uh, those way too early lists are meaningless. I mean, ch check the history, right? Seven, I think one of the lists last year Seven of those top 25 teams didn't make the NCAA tournament. Four of them had losing seasons, didn't play in any postseason. Um, so why do they do those lists? Yes. And so that people can click on them, and we know how important that is. And I'm not – that's great. It brings attention to our to our game. And, and um, I don't – I just don't put credence into uh, into any of it, and I don't really uh, look at it uh, unless I had a buddy from from North Carolina or South Carolina who who texted me and said, "Did you see this?" And you know, I said no, um, and uh, but but I, I don't put any any credence into it. Uh, I, I think we, um, you know, we we've, we've got uh, a lot of work ahead of us. Um, I think that one of the things, Adam, and I don't think I've said this before to this group, um, but one of the things that we tried to do and wanted to do as quickly as we could when we got the job was um, to become relevant as a program. Um, as quickly as we could, we wanted to get relevant uh, as a program. I will never forget the fall uh, after um, I will never forget this as long as I'm here. Um, the fall after we were hired, I went to a Barnes and Noble and um, was uh, grabbing a coffee or whatever. And I always go around the fall to check the, the Athlon, the, the preseason college basketball um, uh, magazines. And in Columbus, in my neighborhood, the uh, college basketball preview comes out and it has a team in our league who was not even at that time picked to finish in the top four or five. But none of our players were on the cover. Um, they had a team from our league's player on, on the cover. Um, and I thought to me that was a significant statement about how relevant our program was at the time. And it's not by any stretch an indictment on on anything other than that was the current state. And obviously, uh, no one had this program more relevant than Thad for a number of, of, of years. But that's where it was. And the challenge was, how do we get that? Well, I went back and checked last year, and C.J. Jackson was a picture of him on the cover. And I, like, felt good. Got warm and fuzzy inside. Um, and. So we're, we're, we're taking strides, we're, we're, we're taking steps, but uh, um, I think we've got a lot to prove before, um, you know, we're, we feel like we are where we need to be. Can you kind of assess how, what you got out of your freshmen this year and what you need out of them going forward? Yeah, um, I, I think uh, all three of them had uh, really all four of them, but particularly three of them had really good moments. Um, um, I, thought, I thought all four at times, but obviously we'll talk about the three that are returning. Uh, Dwayne, Luther, and Justin, um, I think they had moments where they um, 
were impactful in us winning games and winning, having really positive stretches of the season. And then they had other moments where, uh, as they've told me in one-on-one -on -one meetings, man, this is harder than I thought, a lot harder than I thought. Um, so it's good. They, they, they've got a, you know, they, they all three had significant uh, moments, and I think that that is only going to um, help them moving forward. And they all three need to have tremendous off seasons. Uh, as we know, you know, um, the clock moving forward four months doesn't guarantee, you know, you're four months better as a player. Um, so they're going to they're going to need to have important summers, and I believe they will. Chris, um, I saw a video of Greg Oden pleading with coaches to consider him for any vacancies they may have. Could you evaluate him as a, a potential coaching assistant for some staff? Not, I'm not suggesting for your vacancy, but for some yeah. staff down Gre the road. Greg, I think he's tremendous, has a lot to add. Listen, the reality is any time we've seen this all over, uh, I think that um, any time you're a tremendous person, check on Greg, tremendous person, any time you were a tremendous player, um, uh, people always assume that, that the transition to coaching is going to be one that's natural and easy. It's not. It's, it's a tremendous amount of work and time, particularly at this, at this level, because the recruiting dynamic is so, so much a part of, of, of these jobs. Um, and there are years, you know, Ryan Peden has had, you know, 13, 14, 15 years of recruiting contacts from recruiting the state that, that, that just, they, it takes time. So I think that uh, people have to understand that any time a guy in his position uh, transitions at his stage in life, it's, it's, it can be difficult at times. Um, but I would endorse him at the highest level for a position that, that people felt like uh, he was um, uh, qualified for. I just think he adds he would add a ton to to a staff in a really positive way. Did how much of the NCAA tournament, if any, beyond what you participated in, did you did you watch? Um, I usually, you know, we we got beat on Sunday night, right? I think we right. were one of the last games on Sunday night, so. Uh, you know, it usually takes me, you know, I'll come around probably at the end of the next weekend to where I'll watch a couple games. <clears throat> I'm, I'm just wondering, we, we saw a very defensive, heavy yeah. championship yeah. Um, and a great storyline with Virginia. I'm just wondering what you think that all means, big picture for college basketball, whether it's a good thing with the, you know, the defensive dominated. Yeah, I, you know, that's, that's probably, uh, my opinion would be, um, I think, What's good for college basketball is highly competitive, entertaining games. And in some people's minds, that's offensive driven. Um, uh, you know, my eye is, is different because you're, you're in the weeds than the, the guy who's just picking up and starting to watch in, in February and March. Um, or the young lady who may just be turning on a game. She, she may want to see offense. Um, I just think uh, those... Uh, Two teams were tremendous representatives of what high-level basketball looks like in Virginia. That story is that is a that is a movie in the making. It is a tremendous story, and the way they finished their three games, uh, all of which they could have lost their last three games, says a lot about their team and who they are as people. So, I think it was two defensive-minded teams. But the tricky thing with with Virginia, we played them a couple years ago in the NCAA tournament when I was at Butler. And it really shockingly became an offensive, the game was in the 80s, um, is their offensive efficiency is really, really good. It's always top 10 in the country. So while they not, may not post uh, games always in the 80s, they're a highly efficient offensive team. And I think that's what you need to compete at the highest level, along with their defense. I don't want to pick at an open wound, but is your daughter all right? She's great. Thank you for asking. Sorry for that. Um, just man. Don't he, apologize. Yeah, no. He was he 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 was a credible f to her. But yeah, she's she's great. She you know we we were away for a couple of days, so uh, we called her and told her that um, her principal, who she loved, had passed away, and uh, Sophie Shragi, who's her one of her best friends, is leaving. 
So uh, that was, uh, um, you know, a lot of tears for an eight-year-old, but she's, she's bouncing back great. Get her a dog. Maybe. Yeah, two. We got two. Oh, get a third. <laughs> um, did you go to the Final Four? No. Okay. Uh, adding to Lori's question, um, you know, Virginia has like Hunter's a lottery pick, and Guy and Jerome are great players, and Texas Tech, Culver's a lottery pick, and they have great players. But, you know, that championship game wasn't Zion and, yeah. and, and yeah. three top five guys. It wasn't. Yeah. When you watch Virginia or Texas Tech or Auburn or some of the teams like that, is there any part of it that you guys have great players here, but again, you yeah. don't have three lottery picks? Yeah. Do you watch that and think, yeah, that can be us? Sure. Yeah, I think that's um, – you can't sleep uh, thinking about that, really. I think it, 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 um, it really dominates your thinking um, and, uh, you know, monopolizes your time in the off season. How do you build a roster and a team that, that can best position itself for, for those for that night, for Monday night? I also realized that Virginia had knocked on the door as a one seed for, what, four years and hadn't gotten there. Um, and there's something to be said for just knocking on the door and, and, and being there enough times. That happened with Villanova a couple years ago where everybody said Jay Wright couldn't get past the, you know, couldn't win a championship, and he, he's won two in three years. So I, I think the challenge for us is, is really um, – trying to build a roster that is, that is capable of, of, of taking a step forward um, for us and, and knowing that, that not sure what all that's going to look like. But uh, um, I think you, it, it just dominates your thinking in the offseason. How do we um, put ourselves in position to try to, you know, get to a night like that? And – just like super big picture from the moment of, of coming in and wanting your team to be relevant and now, you know, just taking a quick look at how the first two years have gone, is, do you feel like you're on track? Do you feel like what you wanted to do the day you got the job here and where this team is heading into this offseason with this recruiting class is, is the path what you thought it would be? Yeah, I think we're ahead of schedule. Um, ahead of schedule. Why would you say you're ahead of schedule? Well, I didn't think we'd – Go, you know, I, I wasn't sure this quickly we would be in a position <clears throat> to where, um, you know, we would have guys that have had early tournament success, um, uh, both getting there and then and then competing, um, and um, you know, I think that's that's just the reality. Um, now, uh, I also know that, you know. We, like I said, we have a lot of work ahead of us. And um, I think, you know, significant question marks about how, you know, we're going to be in certain areas and the improvement we need to make in certain areas given, um, you know, the year we just went through in the Big Ten. So, um, but uh, I feel like our program is very healthy now. And um, I think having, having, had tournament experience, it gives your guys a taste that, that I think it's important as you continue to talk about, um, you know, getting to that point and then hopefully moving forward. Kind of going off of what Lori said and a little bit of what Doug said, you know, about the defense that these teams that made it, you know, all the way down the line yeah. throughout this tournament, you've kind of placed a very big emphasis on defense here in your – first couple of years. I yeah. mean, does that – not saying you need self-assurance, but, I mean, does that kind of give you some, knowing that that's where the game of basketball is heading and knowing that that's what you guys have implemented? And, I mean, even like a team like what you guys played in Houston, who I think were top three defensively or yeah. something like that. No no doubt. I think that has to be the DNA of your team, and it speaks as much to your, your, your team's competitiveness um, – uh, overall th than anything. Obviously, schematically, there's some important things, but what you're trying to do is create a team that, that competes together, and you most often see that on the defensive end. You see it certainly offensively, but I think if your team's really committed uh, to competing together, you see that a lot on the defensive end. So 
Um, that's always going to be uh, in, in our DNA. Um, but, you know, we, we haven't, you know, we haven't been top 10, uh, which is elite, elite. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a challenge for us moving forward. Um, and then obviously our offensive numbers were very good in year one. We were very good offensively in year one, very efficient. I think finished second in the league and first in defense. We got to get better um, in, in the offensive area. You cannot, I've studied, I've studied all the numbers. You cannot um, advance in the tournament and have uh, typically a defense that is in the 100s in the efficient, uh, it doesn't matter how good your offense is. If your offense is top 10 and your defense is, is 100 in the 100s, you're not going to have a chance to advance. Look back at the numbers right now, and if, you'll, if you study the numbers, you'll see the teams that have advanced in the tournament typically are in the, in the top 50, and the deeper they get, the top 25, um, and in, you know, third weekend stuff like top 10 in offensive and defensive efficiency. And, and, that, and we got to get better uh, in those areas. And kind of switching over to the offensive side of the ball, um, you know, there were times this season where, I mean, you guys were getting plenty of good open looks. There was just some times where you guys just couldn't knock down those shots. I mean, how do you feel about the shooting that you're returning and then the three guys that you're adding this season, or four, I guess, if you count CJ, yeah. um, in terms of adding a lot of that perimeter shooting and, and improving on the offensive side of the ball? Yeah, I think, I think it's got to get better. T guys typically shoot it better as their career progresses, typically. Um, Right, John Diebler's the best example of that here. You look at his numbers his freshman year. Now, he was an elite shooter. But guys typically really improve in that. So that's why we talk about this offseason for, for those guys getting better. Um, you know, Luther's numbers overall looked really good from the three-point line, but he obviously struggled there late. Um, uh, Dwayne needs to get more efficient. Justin's numbers were pretty good. But all three of those guys got to keep making strides. You mentioned Alonzo. Um, what, what position do you – I know you like his versatility, but what position do you think he's going to play initially? I don't know that I'd put a number on it right now, really. But, you know, versatile forward, because I – some of it is I'm just – I'm not sure. Yeah. You know, I have an idea, but one of those forward spots. Mm -hmm. And then C.J. Walker, um, I think he went forgotten for a lot of the he year. Um, what can he bring, and were there moments in practice where you wish that you had him for the games? Yeah. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. He's he's a bulldog. He's tough. He's competitive. He's um, got uh, natural, intangible leadership ability, I believe. Um, and he's also a guy that that uh, um, you know he's he's certainly a point guard, but he's also a guy where you can play kind of two point guards together as well. But um, uh, he's just he's a he's he's going to be a, a a really solid addition, and he played on a super talented Florida State team, and um, you know was solid, had averaged eight points, um, and did some good things for that group. But we're, we're really excited about him. Uh, people might have forgot about him. We we certainly didn't. Okay, thanks, guys.